Hello Horror Hounds, welcome back to my A to Z of Horror. We're already at G and an entry that brings us the triple threat of Hammers, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee and director Terence Fisher. G is for the Gorgon. This series is completely inspired by Jambo Shango and Randy Moll's own A to Z of Horror and in the description field below I will link to their G entry, The Greasy Strangler. But for us here and now, let's delve into some hammer goodness with the Gorgon. Despite the atypical monster taken from Greek mythology, the Gorgon is recognisably hammer, comfortingly so. As soon as the score kicks in by James Bernard over a matte painting of a domineering castle in some fictional uh, Germanic woodland setting, we're in familiar and welcome territory. But perhaps familiar with a little twist, like Bernard's addition to the score of a female soprano combined with an electronic instrument called a Nova chord, sounding a little like a siren song, one of the many indicators that Greek mythology is going to be plundered here rather than meticulously researched. This is your traditional, typical Hammer film with a bit of a twist. But is it a lesser Hammer film? A lot of people look sideways at the Gorgon because of its admittedly subpar monster effects and its somewhat stately pace. But if you can look past that, there's a bittersweet story that's much more layered with nuance, with nuanced performances to match. This one is less about shocks and outright scares, but goes for a certain chill with its doomed romantic gothicism. And you've no doubt got Hammer's heaviest hitters. Let's start with Peter Cushing. A lot of commentators think it's of note that Cushing here is playing a more villainous aspect, seeming to forget his six turns as Baron Frankenstein. And whilst Cushing's Dr. Namoroff is surely an antagonist, once you've reached the end of the story, you'll see him as a figure just as tragic as the doomed lovers are. It's actually a joy to re-watch the film, now understanding his motivation to watch the shades he mixes into one of his most subtle performances. Then we have Christopher Lee, clearly relishing the opportunity to play an out-and-out -out hero. Here he's playing a man much older than his years, and he appears to have modelled his look on a sort of swashbuckling Albert Einstein type of mentor figure. Lee only really sweeps into the film for its final third, but he does so with such gusto and relish and all the best lines in the movie that the film is given a much needed jolt as it moves towards the final reel. Lee is playing a character called Professor Karl Meister, and this is the closest we'll ever get to seeing him playing Van Helsing. Fans of both Lee and Cushing who are keen to see a different type of dynamic between these two than we are normally presented with should definitely be directed towards both the Gorgon and Horror Express, a film I talked about a long time ago. I'll link to that video in the description field and which uh, an excellent channel called Frightfully Forgotten have recently discussed and I will link to their video review for Horror Express as well. And I will urge you to check that out, subscribe to them. Well worth it. Excellent channel. Highly, highly recommended. And we also, uh, performance of note, have Barbara Shelley playing Clara, assistant to Cushing's Dr. Namorov and love interest to Richard Pascoe's Paul Heights. Whilst Pascoe's a bit of a sop, in my opinion, Shelley imbues her character with dignity, poise, grace, and an internal life that wasn't always afforded to the female leads in Hammer films, who were usually required to bring the requisite Hammer glamour by going barefoot, wearing diaphanous gowns, and showing copious amounts 
of cleavage. Don't get me wrong, Barbara Shelley brings glamour in spades. It's just more of a grown-up variety instead of Hammer's sometime mixture of shock and titillation. For the record, I have absolutely nothing against Hammer's sometime mixture of shock and titillation. So, people are occasionally dying in this fictional Germanic town that Hammer so loves to set all of its British thesps amongst, and the victims turn up turned to stone. One of the Gorgons, they believe, now resides in or around the town, and Every once in a while, people succumb to her. There's a real lost opportunity here to mine the myth of the Gorgons. Given that so many thrillers, slashers, giallo movies, psycho killer movies are predicated on the idea of the murderous male gaze, it's such a novelty to have a woman staring back and this Medusa image of the deadly female gaze is primed with such significance and meaning. Whilst it's nice that one of Medusa's other sisters gets a look in other than the, the, the well-worn, well-trodden myth of Medusa, everything here mythologically is a real muddle. The Gorgon of this film is not Medusa, although she has the snakes for hair and she, if anyone sees her, they're turned instantly to stone. According to Ovid's version, there are different versions of the Gorgon stories. According to Ovid, it was Medusa only who had the snakes for hairs and turned people to stone. There is a great modern day Medusa story out there waiting to be told. This ain't it. No, the monster here is called Megara, and Megara wasn't even one of the Gorgon sisters. That's the name of one of the Furies. It's Megara's spirit that seems to invade a human, sort of from time to time. There have been seven murders over the last five years. This sort of possession, I guess, of the host only takes place during the full moon for no good reason at all. It just means that the Gorgon joins uh, a small group of movies that pretend that the full moon is something that happens over a number of nights, leading to ridiculous lines like, this is the second night of the full moon. Strip out the lunar influence that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, and you can ditch all of that nonsense with it instantly. And it begs the question, if this immortal spirit of Megara is inhabiting a, a human, does killing the woman who's possessed by Megara at the end of the movie kill the spirit of evil itself? Or does Christopher Lee just have a headless corpse on his hands to explain away at the gorgeously gloomy end of the movie? One thing that pilfering like a magpie from Greek myth does seem to have lent the script is an air of doomed fatalism that is in keeping with the Greek tradition of tragedy. Indeed, I argue that the identity of the villain, who the evil resides in, isn't really supposed to be a big reveal. Uh, I think one red herring aside, the viewer is supposed to be ahead of everyone involved so that they can feel the full force of fate acting to conspire against mortal plans for happiness. But with a Gorgon you get the wonderful method of death being turned to stone. One of the things I love in the Gorgon is that yes, some people are more or less instantly turned to stone. There's a character who rather than seeing her directly glimpses her and that means the curse or the infection or whatever it is doesn't take hold instantly, but he is doomed. He is turned to stone slowly and he knows what's happening to him. And I delighted in that. I thought it was fantastic. The victims, once they see Megara, also before they turn to stone, get these, get these marks on their forehead that I don't understand 
at all. My girlfriend suggested it might indicate where the snakes have bitten, but I'm not completely sold on that. Does anyone else have any other ideas as to why, before being turned to stone, which is enough, you'd have thought, that these uh, puncture marks appear in the victim's foreheads? Because I've got no answers to that at all. Earlier I said this was Hammer, but Hammer perhaps with a twist, and I think that twist might be universal. Hammer hit pay dirt by refitting Universal's classic monsters, Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy, for a new generation. Racier, bloodier, sexier. Of course, Hammer branched out further than that with zombies, Satanism, Sherlock Holmes and aliens. But here, plundering Greek mythology for a cinematic villain, Terence Fisher seems to have woven a film that harkens back to the spooky mood music of universal features like The Mummy and The Wolfman, chills an atmosphere, romanticism with lashings of fatalism rather than Kensington gore and heaving bosoms. There are some who think the film's too slow and the pacing falters in the middle section, and I have some sympathy with that, but the Gorgon does have a stately pace. Things are shaken up in the final 30 minutes with the arrival of Christopher Lee and just before the final appearance of the monster, a cracking, swashbuckling fight. We tend to think of Peter Cushing as a gaunt, aged figure of benevolence in these movies, in a world of evil, but as a younger man his performances were remarkably physical. Think of his rush across the tabletop, leaping at the curtains to drag them down at the end of Dracula, allowing the lethal sunlight in. There's a great fight at the end of the Gorgon. Carlos erstwhile suitors Cushing and Pasco thrash it out, armed with a sabre and a wrought iron candelabra, respectively. Neither actor holds back. Pasco seems to genuinely want to take Cushing's head off with the candelabra. And watching Cushing, so full of energy and strength, is a joyous thing to behold. Whilst the Gorgon's not for everyone, and I can understand why it's not for everyone, it is for me. Sometimes I do want to just immerse myself into a spooky, chilling world of atmosphere rather than one of shocks, scares and special effects. There will be other lyrical entries in my A to Z of horror. Films more concerned with mood, atmosphere and chills than shock and gore. That is absolutely not the case for our next entry. As far removed from the Gorgon's languid grandeur as you could possibly hope to get. The next film is known by two titles. Both are equally serviceable for H. So please join me next time. And I'll leave a little picture clue at the end of my video when we find out H is for